general Q and A. Um, if any of you have questions you want to talk about, um, we are recording. So if for some reason you don't want your face on a recording, feel free to turn off your video. Um, but otherwise, we'd love to to see you and see your video and um, be able to hear you. You're all on mute, but you can unmute yourselves at any time, or I can unmute you if you want to say something, ask a question, or make a comment. Any questions before we jump in? There's also, you can either raise your hand, like just wave at me, or there's a little um, Zoom button that says raise your hand, which I'll see also if you want to get my attention. And in the chat box, which you'll be monitoring because sure. I won't be able to keep track of that. But yeah. if you have uh, something you want to write down, put it in the chat box and Kat will see it. Absolutely. All right, Kata. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, those that made it live and those that registered and will be watching this later. It's great to have you all with us. And um, I always like to begin uh, these conversations with gratitude. And that is gratitude for the, the ones that have come before us, the ancestors um, of all peoples, human and non-human people that, on whose shoulders we stand and that enable us to ha sit here and have this conversation and talk about what, you know, what is evolutionary leadership? How, what is that about? How, what is this particular way of stepping into that form of leadership? So I want to acknowledge our ancestors, those seven generations and beyond behind us and those seven generations and beyond in front of us. And thank you for the way that they have lived their lives that enable us to be here on this evening with each other and in this circle. So, so welcome again. I um, was uh, walking around uh, the lake the other day thinking about this, uh, this conversation. And um, I just wonder where to begin. And a few things came to mind. And, uh, and I love, you know, stories are like, they're, they're like things that look for you and find you and grab you. They aren't so much things that we seek out, but they seek us out. And so I, this story found me walking around the lake. And it was, gosh, I don't know how many years ago, um, probably early 2000s. I was going to the YMCA. And I walked in the front door and they had this, this fish bowl sitting on the, the counter there. And inside the fish bowl were all these little pieces of paper. It was like, if you, if you like fortune cookies, this was like a treasure. <laughs> Cause you didn't know what they said. So the idea is, is you come in, you just reach in and pull one out. And so I did, I reached in and I pulled one out as I walked by the counter and I looked at it and it was a quote, I believe by Max Dupree. And it said, the first response, and I'm gonna paraphrase it slightly, the first responsibility of a leader is to define the road ahead. The last responsibility of a leader is to say, thank you. And in between those two things, the leader is a servant. And that really spoke to me about what leadership is. And this idea of leadership being um, not something that we first offer others, but something that we first navigate our way to in our own lives. How do we become that leader, uh, that, that tip of the spear, as they say, in our own life? And so rites of passage, um, rites of passage ceremonies, initiations, um, but all the various names around the planet throughout history that those things have been called, whether it's been called vision quest ceremony or walkabout or hill walking, um, that these methods of, of going into the wilderness, and up, let's say go up on the mountain or to fast and pray for vision, uh, that you bring it back for your people. And so it was never simply about yourself, but your medicine is that, that gift that you carry in yourself, that, that gift that you're born with, the medicine you're born with, that you came into this world to deliver. And um, so this way of leadership being to first connect deeply uh, to the sacred and, and to the, the depth of, of medicine that we each carry in ourselves, um, and then to come off that experience, come off that 
what I call to brush up against the sacred, which is really the same thing as brushing up against death. Um, that those old concepts of death as an ally. So to brush up against death or brush up against the sacred is to, to encounter um, an activation of a memory of these agreements you would have made with your ancestors before coming here about who you're coming here to be. And so that's a context of how I hold uh, these initiatory passage, the, the rite of passage. Um, the other story that came to me walking around the lake when I thought of, oh, this brush up against the sacred, brush up against death, it's all the same thing. And in and, and the way that globally we are brushing up against the, those uh, sacred moments in quite some challenges for many people. Um, and I remembered a time back in 2012, and I was, I was in a, you, you've, heard the, you've heard the term dark night of the soul. Um, well, this was like dark two years of the soul. <laughs> I was going through a separation divorce period at that time and, and just couldn't extract myself from the turmoil of it. And a friend of mine uh, invited me to come down to uh, Australia, to Perth, or Western Australia, and then up into the Northern Territory on a walkabout. He was an outback survivalist. And uh, so I went down there with him, and, and uh, one of the weekends we were there, we were um, out on this, this freshwater lake, and we were guiding the, this group of Aboriginal kids and, and other kids just through a, a weekend experience. And, um, I had, the, I had the real blessing of having my, my daughter at the time, I forget how old she was, maybe 21, 22, um, was there with us. And so um, we were out on this lake and we were canoeing. Now, if you know anything about crocodiles in, in Australia, <laughs> um, there are what they call the salties, very bad. <laughs> and then there's the freshwater cock crocodiles, very, very scary but they say not so, not so bad unless you step on one. And now these, these things are like dinosaurs. They're, you know, when I say 20 feet, 25 feet, those are not exaggerations. So we're in this freshwater lake and we're canoeing. And, uh, and as we're canoeing, uh, my daughter is probably about 50 yards ahead of me in another canoe with some kids in her canoe and I'm canoeing with my kids in my canoe and there's others behind us some distance. And I see way off to the left, these, these uh, long ripples coming through the water right toward her canoe. And when I say long, I'm guessing, look, 20, again, 20, 25 feet long of rippling across the top of the water. So I know what this is. And I've been assured by my friend, Bob, who uh, is the outback for Sablis, he said, don't worry about the freshwater crocodiles. Um, so I see this thing coming toward her canoe. And I'm watching the Aboriginal kids in her canoe uh, glance over and look at it, and they don't seem impressed at all. So I'm thinking that's a good sign. <laughs> and, um, and then I watch it, and about mm, 15 or 10 yards right before her canoe, it disappears, and the ripples go underwater. And then 15 yards on the other side of the canoe, they reappear and keep going. So the next day, uh, I had got a little bit of uh, dehydration. So I was in the boat with Bob, the, the lead boat, in this little motor boat. And so we were out on the lake and stopped for lunch. And we threw over the anchor and it was just he and I, and we had lunch and it was time to go and, and you know, rally up the, the canoes again. So I go to pull on the anchor and it won't come on, it won't come loose. And we work it and work it, it still won't come loose. And we're in about, I'm guessing it was 20, 25 feet of water and it's black water, dark, can't see anything. And, um, and there's a bit of a pull on the boat. So the boat's pulling back so that the line is, is tight. Um, and so Bob looks at me and says, well, we're gonna have to go down there and get it and undo the anchor, kind of pull it up from wherever it's stuck. And I said, okay. And he said, well, I'm gonna drive the boat and you'll, you'll need to go down there. And I said, well, why is that? <laughs> he said, well, one, it's my boat. <laughs> and I'm gonna 
loosen the tension on the anchor line. So when you get down there, you can, you know, find it and loosen it. And um, so what's going through my mind at this point is, you know, visions of this dinosaur monster that I saw just the other day. And the other is that I trust this man with my life. Um, and, and he's my guide. And he tells me that freshwater crocodiles are not interested in, you know, dining on humans the way saltwater crocodiles are. And because uh, we've had many conversations. So I just, he handed me a mask and I spit in the mask. What you, what you do when you're going underwater, you spit in it, rub the slob around so you can see. <clears throat> and I rinsed it out and I put it on and I dove in and grabbed the anchor line and I just pulled, 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 pulled as fast, as fast as I could go with horrible visions of monster dinosaurs moving all around. <laughs> um, got down to the anchor and sure enough, he had moved the boat so it was loose and I pulled it up and turned around and grabbed the line and came up the line as fast as I could go. It seemed like an eternity going down because I couldn't see anything. Um, and I got back up in the boat. <clears throat> And the reason that story I think came up when I thought about this, this, this conversation about, one about this training and about uh, becoming a, a ceremonial guide, um, rites of passage guide, is um, that in that moment, <clears throat> I leaned in strongly to my trust in the sacred, my, my belief in him and his expert knowledge. Um, because I had come to the edge in the end of my own knowledge and resourcefulness. So I had to reach out for something greater <clears throat> than my own. And um, in the essence of a, an initiatory passage, uh, we, we all come to that place. I think globally we are in that place now um, where we have to reach out for something greater than our own limited capacity to dream, our own limited resourcefulness, um, and allow ourselves to be guided uh, by those who have walked this path before us and by something even greater than that. Um, so when I think about this training, you know, it's, I could say it's a training in becoming a ceremonial midwife because that's really the essence of it. It's not uh, doing something, but it's more of a midwifery of ceremony to usher somebody through their own passage. So when they turn to us and say, you know, it's dark down there, there's monsters, <laughs> big crocodiles down there, <clears throat> and you tell me it's okay to walk down there you know, to have somebody to turn to um, that can guide us. So, um, so yeah, just a powerful story to, to kind of launches into this conversation of uh, this particular training. So this is a 16 month long training. Kat spoke about it earlier. She's at the tail end of the training. It's about to finish up for her session um, next week. And then I have an, uh, another group. I see a couple of people or at least one one person that's in that in that circle and then another one that starts in August that will run to November of 2021. And so it's a the the logistical framework of the training and it's that it's um, I guess that's 16 months and we meet six times over the 16 months for uh, a different training module or session. Um, the, uh, and I've been guiding uh, my own initiation into guiding um, rites of passage began in, um, uh, really began in 1992 uh, when my father died and something woke up in me that had not been awake since I was 14. And I began to navigate my way back to a trailhead that I actually was at back then. I just didn't know it. And I found that trailhead through a series of calling experiences that I may name in a little bit. Um, and then into an apprenticeship with Stephen Foster and Meredith Little at the School of Lost Borders. 
um, and to apprentice in in this work and then to um, and came off the mountain with the knowing that you know that being a, a rites of passage guide a vision fast guide um, was the work I came here to do um, and then over the course of the next however many years that is began to blend the clinical because my, my, my background since I was 25 is that I've been a psychotherapist and um, clinical mental health since 1985. And so I began to blend the clinical awareness and perspective with the indigenous. Um, and so, or the, the, the clinical lens with the indigenous lens. What, what, what we might say is going on here and then what they would say is going on here. And then over the years, um, you know, they, it wove together like braided sweet grass and very, and very eventually just became one thing. Um, and so it's, it's uh, but it's that, that holding those two lens. And so in the training, um, and you don't have to be a, uh, a clinically licensed practitioner of some kind. <clears throat> uh, but the training is divided up into six, six training modules. And the first one is, is uh, presenting a, a, a version of the medicine wheel um, that, is, uh, that we overlay with um, both, I would say, uh, an ancient wisdom and a psychological wisdom um, so that, uh, and we deeply learn that so that if somebody comes to me or if I'm just find somebody out there, so I'm, I see Grace. So if Grace came to me and sat down and told me a story about, you know, what was going on with her, what I'm doing is I'm listening through the wheel and, um, and I will find her on that wheel somewhere in her story. And if I find her on the wheel in her story uh, between the South and the West, or what we call the initiatory shield of the South and the initiatory shield of the West, then that tells me something about the challenges she is facing at that place. It also tells me what particular kind of rituals address that thing. And so, we, we learn the wheel. The first two training sessions are really deeply learning the foundation of what I call, um, what we could call medicine wheel diagnostics and ritual prescriptive response. Um, and so I feel that's uh, like foundational to any nature based or soul based guide is that we be able to listen through a framework or a cosmology that's anchored in nature. Um, and from that place, hear their story, hear their challenge, um, and then be able to um, offer um, a ritual prescription that will address that specific thing. And so that learning that framework, you know, again, we spend the first two sessions uh, learning and practicing on each other so that after the first two sessions, uh, the apprentices are adept at, at doing that. So we can bring a story, you could, you know, if you do work with people, you can then say, you know, I want you to go take a walk in nature uh, before I see you next time and then come back and tell me about it. And then from that, you can draw a whole uh, framework of what's going on with them and also offer them a ritual prescription, maybe an elemental oriented ritual prescription, maybe an ancestral oriented ritual prescription um, to, to go and enact and then come back and tell you that information. Um, so in, in guiding people um, in a ceremonial way, in the use of ritual, um, it, I think it's, it's, it's essentially important to have a, uh, a very precise uh, foundation and cosmology of, of uh, what I would call diagnostics, and then a, a very precise response in terms of ritual prescription. There, there are, uh, when we think about rituals and you think about uh, elemental rituals, for instance, water ritual, uh, fire ritual, earth ritual, nature ritual, mineral ritual, air ritual, mountain, you know, mountain ritual. 
there is precise reasons why you would go one way or another based on where somebody lands on the wheel. So somebody stuck, as I say, if we go back to the example of using graces, our guinea pig stuck between the South and the West, uh, the questions in my mind is, has she brought enough energy to manifest whatever vision she's holding? And if, and if not, then we'll back up into the wheel onto, into the South and maybe work with fire. If she has completed that, and then this difficulty in moving into the West, uh, which is equivalent to difficulty of receiving, West being associated with autumn, with the harvest, with bringing in nourishment. And if there's a, if there's a stuck place in the wheel there, then we, we look at what are the, the gatekeepers, as I call them, what are the gatekeepers that interfere with the ability to receive? Um, so that one can fully move into the West, to fully receive the bounty, the harvest of their creative endeavors. Um, and that's just one example. And if that was the stuck place, then I'm thinking we are probably gonna be doing a water ritual and a certain kind of water. I mean, it gets very precise, you know, maybe not waterfall, but maybe still water or, or gentle river water there. Um, and so the, in, in the prescriptive ritual response, you think of the elements uh, as the active ingredients, as it's called, to the medicine. So, so a ritual without an elemental presence is a ritual without its active ingredients. Um, so to bring in, and what particular active ingredients moves one into that next initiatory shield of the wheel? Um, and similarly, if, if someone, let me, let me pick on someone else in the circle, uh, we'll say Elaine. <laughs> um, so if Elaine was, was stuck between the north and the east on the wheel, what that would tell me is that there's um, some uncertainty about how to show up in their life, maybe even some fear, some hesitation about how to show up or what the next step is. There's generally confusion um, that a person manifests at that place. Maybe they even have internal messages around it's not okay to see or be seen. Um, and so I'm tracking for all of these things. And if I see that that's where they're on the wheel, then one thought is, do they need to back up into the north, uh, to the place of earth rituals, to the place of stillness, and the place of letting go? And, and letting go being proportional to self-acceptance on a psychological reference, you know, that the degree that we let go is a proportional to degree that we have self-acceptance. So this, this place in the north of deep surrender, deep letting go, what I say, surrendering so deeply that spring simply shows up because we let go enough. That's the east, that's the movement around the wheel. So I'm asking as I'm listening to this person's story, is this a movement into the north? Might we be doing earth rituals? Or, uh, or rituals of deep release and surrender in order to, to touch the sacred, you know, to, to fully move around the wheel from west to east. There, there's this necessity of, of surrender um, that is uh, to have a real complete passing. I say it's not a surrender you choreograph yourself um, because by the very nature, if you choreograph it, it's not surrender. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like being broken open from the outside by outside forces of life that, that, that strip us to the bone um, and we feel broken open, um, you know, what I call empty palms and, and open heart. And, and it begins with, I don't know what to do, that place. And in that place of surrender, um, that's, that's necessary for grace to enter our lives. Because um, without that place, grace doesn't have any wiggle room to get in there to find us. And so the rituals, elemental rituals, are, are, are ways of responding to those kind of awarenesses with people. Um, you know, I mentioned elemental rituals. There are also ancestrally, ancestral line clearing, ancestor rituals that are, that are different. They involve elements, but they also have a different type of uh, or added focus along with the elemental presence. There's another focus um, in terms of working with ancestral 
uh, lineage traumas or, or disconnections or, or lostness or grief that can travel through a family line. Um, and there are certain ritual ways of responding to those things as well. Um, so the first, as I say in the training, the first two sessions is really about diving in deep to, to have that map, to have that orientation of understanding um, so that as you do guide people, which is the eventual, you know, where we're headed with all of this as a, uh, a ceremonial wilderness guide is what I call it, that you have a framework and a map for how you arrive at what you do with people. Like there's a, a system, a cosmology um, of information that guides you to understand where they are um, in, in offering any ritual prescription uh, for someone. Um, and then the, uh, Kata, but before you go on, I just want yeah. to interrupt you. Um, Elaine just posted me a question about wanting to understand more about where the medicine wheel had come from, like which traditions it draws on, which cultures did you create it? Like, where did it come from? Um, so the, the, the truest response I have that comes to me immediately is it came out of the ground. It came out of the seasons. It, it came out of the bones of our ancestors. It, it came out of our, our um, humanity's way of orienting ourselves uh, toward understanding creation and ourselves. So it had to do with uh, any uh, ancient culture, when we go back far enough, the way that they drew their cosmology or cosmological understanding of themselves and others was, was where they stood. So you stand on the land that your people, your ancestral people are from or they lived and you orient yourself to the east. And what is the east like? If, the, if it's the place of the rising sun and what is the land like, the plants like, the orientation to creation like as you face east. And then turning south, um, you know, we, we orient maybe seasonally toward the summer, at least in the northern hemisphere. Um, and again, I'll, I'll stick with the, the Northern Hemisphere. I don't know if anybody out there is in uh, um, down below. But um, and, 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 and you orient elementally to a direction, to a season. Um, and so turning the wheel, turning the seasons, turning the directions, turning the elements, and then there's the axis mundi, you know, the great above, the great below, the heaven and earth, the, the shamanic tree of life uh, that, that connects to, the, and then the center place, which is of course everywhere. Um, so, you know, to say all ancient cultures, when you go back far enough, had a cosmological way of understanding themselves and creation through a, uh, a wheel of uh, that we say first begins, in a way I'd say it begins with the directions. And so we orient ourselves in a place and in a direction. Um, and so we say east, north, south, west, or east, south, west, north, to kind of move around the wheel this way. Um, and then from that place, the next thing is from a direction you might think of then a season. Now this is where it gets different. You know, you switch hemispheres of the planet and things are gonna be different because down below, if you go north, it doesn't get cold, it gets hot. Um, so the next place is, you know, I would say a seasonal imprint. Um, and then beginning to uh, orient yourself to all of creation is existing on a wheel, um, whether it's a Celtic wheel that, you know, around the Celtic wheel, they would have the, you know, maybe that beginning place at Samhain. And then we have the, the winter solstice, and then we have um, in bulk, and then we have uh, Beltane, and then we have the summer solstice, and then we have Lunasa, and then we're back around the Samhain. And so it's a, a, a circular eight shields orientation. So we can find this, this way of relating uh, you know, in, in ancient indigenous cultures all over the planet. Um, so the other part is, um, 
one of the earliest uh, people to psychologize a wheel, at least in Western society um, or, or more modern society was uh, Carl Gustav Jung. And he began to study indigenous cultures and what he noticed in these cosmology systems, he began to overlay a psychology to it. Um, so he might in the East uh, put infancy or, or spirit, you know, spirit kind of on this edge and infancy right here, this place of showing up. Um, and then in the South, he, I think he put uh, um, reactive emotion in the physical body. And then in the West, he put uh, the psyche or adolescence turning inward, the way nature begins to turn inward on itself in, in autumn. And in the North, he put the mind, clear thought. Um, and so, you know, from that, we, we begin to extrapolate uh, a whole psychological awareness that is also overlaid and integrated um, in, the, in these wheels. Um, so, you know, I guess I go back to my first answer, Kat, where does it come from? Um, I think it comes out of the ground. I think uh, our consciousness and our, our own dreaming being dreamed here from the earth, essentially. And, um, and it's like turning back towards the ground from which we've come, from which we've evolved and, and uh, beginning to understand ourselves and the rest of creation. So, other, any other questions? Okay. Can I, I, I want to get more specific yeah. on the question. So from an academic standpoint, because that's how I approach things um, mm -hmm. from, I mean, I approach it from the heart and intuitively, but also from a scholarly mm -hmm. and intellectual direction. Mm -hmm. So basically, yes, the teachings come from the ground, grandmother, spider, earth. Mm -hmm. However, for the purpose of this training and you, what you're sharing with us, did you synthesize this from all of your various teachings and put it into a, a new creation for this? Or was this what was taught specifically to you from the Fosters, excuse me, uh, Foster and Little and Maladoma? Or how exactly, would, who synthesized all this? Yeah, lots of different places. My synthesis of it, and a lot of people have synthesized mm -hmm. their understanding of the wheel, you know, um, Stephen Foster and Meredith Little, you know, first time I sat with him, he, he took four stones, red, yellow, black, and white, set them on a stump and just started talking about mm -hmm. the wheel. Um, you know, there are many people um, in, in West Africa, Maladoma, they have a five elemental cosmological wheel that looks a little different. I've learned a way to, to translate between what might be more, uh, consistent kind of wheel we might see on this continent. Um, there's no definitive way of, of organizing uh, um, a cosmological medicine wheel. Um, it's, it's different. Um, so a lot of it also comes from all of my experiences being in nature. Mm -hmm. um, when I go down to the river um, at sunrise and, and uh, and sing and offer some milk and honey to the river as the sun's coming up and the mist is on the water. It's like, oh, that to me, that's east. That, that's a new day. That's, that's uh, um, I can feel it, you know. So I have that kind of experiential orientation uh, or, or going out at night in deep snow um, under, under full moon um, in, in winter. And, and so you get a, a visceral experiential memory of, of this and it becomes more personal. So yes, there's the, the academic reference points. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the wheels themselves are like rabbit holes. You know, they, you can go down and down and down and, and, and um, having a map of understanding it helps you navigate it, but there's, there's no bottom to it really. Um, so definitely Stephen Foster, Marathel, Mel Meldoma, Carl Jung, um, my own experiences, um, psychology, and, and looking at different 
the ways that psychology overlays onto it. Um, and then working with people. Um, like for instance, I was doing um, a ritual process piece of work in helping somebody prepare for, for um, death lodge. And I can see a, at least one person, two people, three people that were at this death lodge. <laughs> death lodge is kind of a preparation place for getting ready for vision quest ceremony. And the person sat down and they said, oh, I feel something in my stomach, in my, in my abdomen. Okay. And that's my question to them was, tell me about it. Is it, is it like a pressure or is it like an emptiness? If they would have said pressure, my mind would have oriented toward the South and toward fire and toward the possibility that this is going to go toward a fire ritual before we're done here. If they say emptiness, my mind's going to turn toward earth, toward North, toward belonging, toward place. And, and likely, you know, we're going to end up in working with earth in some capacity. Um, so a lot of the experiences, um, you know, learn um, kind of how to navigate the wheel and how to navigate people's story and, and their orientation toward ritual uh, prescription based on what's happening in the moment. So uh, I would say the people I've worked with have been also the greatest teacher. Um, this person said, uh, no, actually, it was a different, a different death lodge, not, not ones involving the three of you, but another one that happened after that. It was, he said, emptiness. Um, and as he talked, I just took a handful of earth and put it in his hands. He had a memory of, uh, of something from Israel um, that his grandfather said at that moment. And before we were done, he was painted in earth and we were walking to the river and we went into the river and, you know, it just unfolded. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, so it, it's experience gives you a lot of it too. Just having the basic map and then you just start working with it. Um, so let's, uh, let me move on and save some time at the very end for questions. Going to go down, it looks like 19 minutes. What's hey, that? Wendy. Wendy has a question, but we can, we can come oh. back, Wendy, if that's okay. Oh, well, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Just quickly, I was, and I want to answer it at the end, maybe. When you're doing all your rituals, um, I, I'm surrounded by different, you know, mm -hmm. uh, First Nations people. Mm -hmm. I'm always aware of having to be so sensitive that, you know, you're not being accused of, of cultural appropriation. Um, mm -hmm. even, yes, we all have a birthright to spirituality, but, um, you know, we're drawing from, from different areas and different cultures. I'm just curious, have you... Have you ever had to address this in the work that you do? Um, yes, yes. Okay. And it's uh, part of the first session of the training, we talk about that. Oh, okay. Um, so that's included. If you went on the website and look at what's included in each training module, um, you'll see all of these things spoken like that's in the first session. Yeah. Um, so there, there are those things that I would consider to be pan-cultural mm -hmm. um, and not specific to culture, tribe, village, um, and that is relationship to the elements, relationship to initiatory rites of passage in some form and process. And, and there are common elements, even, even in a, a rite of passage around the world, there are, are common themes and elements like fasting, exposure, and solitude are always in there. Um, so relationship to the elementals or elements, relationship to the, the uh, spirits of place, nature, one, like the place one's in, um, how to be grateful and be in relationship with uh, uh, the spirits of place. Um, and, I'm, and that's a big kind of global net when I say those words, as you know, Wendy. Um, but and then um, ancestors, these are certainly having relationship and understanding that community, the word community refers to the living and the non-living. And, and, in, um, and we've lost that in, in many ways, at least in modern society, this, this understanding of relationship with ancestors as a crucial and important piece in how we navigate forward. Mm -hmm. um, so those are, those are things I consider to be across culture, relationship to, to nature, 
to the spirits of place, to the elementals, to ancestors, to rites of passage. Um, they didn't belong, uh, maybe a particular form or structure of doing it belong one place. Mm -hmm. But the presence of itself has no specific place. It just belongs without being everywhere. Um, so I distinguish those things. It's different than, um, you know, in my work with Melodoma and going to Africa with him, um, I learned the process of grief ritual the way that he does a grief ritual. Now, even he took what they did in the village, because you can't do exactly that, and, and translated it to a, a model that could be delivered here. Mm. Um, but I also consider even um, offering that, like I don't teach that. Um, that's something, you know, he taught me and gave me permission to do, uh, among other things. So it's, um, but these, so I focus more on that, which is pan-cultural. And in this idea of developing relationship to, uh, to those things that we have uh, gotten out of relationship with, that's caused the mess that we're in. Um, and, and this, there's a thread of connection that goes from that, uh, that can, can go out here and connect to uh, racism. It can go out here and connect to climate disaster, to economic injustice, social injustice. It's like this disassociation of relationship with the, uh, another. Mm -hmm. And um, and so again, so much of the first in session is to reconnect here, you know, with dealing with any unresolved wounds, traumas, turmoils. That's that's the beginning place, mm -hmm. um, and then from there extending it out to the other, the other being not just human. Right. Um, so. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, so that speaks of some of the other uh, things in the, the sessions that we, we lean into and, and um, teach. And um, so in the third session, um, uh, it, not just understanding somebody's story from an elemental where they are on the wheel and what's going on, but to really understand this concept of working with ancestors. And as some of you know, that I always like to say that, you know, being an ancestor doesn't, uh, or being dead doesn't make one an ancestor, no more than being alive makes somebody healthy, conscious, and well. And that like the old Irish proverb says that the troubles in, in the other world can only be healed from this world. And the troubles in this world can only be healed from that world. And so there's this, in that proverb, there's this reciprocal understanding and relationship that's necessary, that uh, as they tend the fire there, they help us here. And as we tend this fire, we help that, the, the ones that are stuck in between heal. Um, and so I present it in more of that fashion. And if somebody wants to have a conversation that's more psychological, like epigenetics or family constellation work, um, you can frame it that way. But I'm framing it like, no, we're actually working with the, the unresolved ancestors. And we're working in connection with the, those that are well in spirit to assist us in healing those difficulties and turmoils. Um, and so there's, uh, I think as a, as a ceremonial guide, you, it's a extremely important to have that awareness um, so everything doesn't simply get um, psychologized into a person's personal biography, um, that it can extend beyond that. Um, and uh, whether it's you know generational trauma or things like that, but just being aware of that lens. Um, and, and how do you work with that in terms of um, accessing support and, and uh, from those realms and calling on assistance. I could say like to personalize this, you know, to, to call on your great grandfather or great grandmother, uh, the one who lived well and died well. Um, and I don't have time to share lots of stories, 
about all that, but it, it's that concept that, you know, we're working in collaboration with um, uh, our ancestors for our descendants, you know, and the lives that are to come. Um, so we spend a third session with that. And in that session, um, we include things like basic journeying techniques, working with the drum and how to journey. Also, um, techniques that I've, I've uh, both learned and practiced and honed over the years around uh, what could be called remote viewing or remote tracking. Um, or if I borrow a psychological word, we could call it intuitive resonance. Um, but, you know, you think of somebody and they call you on the phone. That's always kind of the favorite example. Like, how do you do that intentionally? How do you focus your, your, your intent and your receptivity to track that kind of information from somebody you're working with intentionally? So it's not just, oh, this happened. It was really neat. I, you know, I thought of them or thought of this and they, this thing happened. Um, but the, the, the methodology behind um, tracking um, in, in that fashion um, and, and reading in that fashion. And it always, uh, I love, I love that, those particular practice session because it always surprises people how uh, how skilled they actually can be when they learn a few techniques of how to do that. Um, one of the things I'll do after uh, teaching a few things to, to the apprentices is I'll have one uh, uh, half the half the line stand here and the other half stand here in front. Everybody's facing somebody essentially about three feet in front of them. And then I'll say, all right, everybody on this side of the, the line, I want you to blindfold yourselves, close your eyes, keep your eyes closed. And then everybody that's on the other side, I want you to go stand in front of somebody else. And then um, those with your blindfolds on, now I want you to do these steps that we've talked about. And, um, and then notice what, what you pick up all by itself thoughts, feelings, physical sensations, images, anything at all that starts to come into your field, just notice it and remain silent. And the other person will remain silent. And then after three minutes, take off your blindfold and tell the person everything you know about them, um, everything that came up. Um, and so uh, to, to use a Barbara Brennan word, people begin to learn what is their particular method of high sense perception. Um, way more people are, are um, kinesthetically oriented than they would aware, it's like, than they are aware of. That you can track things in your body that don't belong to you. And, and it's as information about the other. As uh, uh, one of my native teachers said to me, he said, uh, um, you know, I was relating something I was feeling or thinking and he said, is that yours? And I realized what he was asking me. It's like, okay, let me check in. No, actually, it's not mine. It comes from this other place. And so, you know, it's just a simple exercise. So when you're, when you're guiding people, you're expanding your awareness of what you're attracting, um, not just simply from them, but also how do you track the greater environment around you um, so that, you know, a hawk flies in from the north and lands in a tree and, and squawks three times and all of a sudden you're getting information about something and you just bring it into what's going on. You just check it out. Um, literally I've had stuff like that happen. Um, bird flies in, touched the top of somebody's head, flew out of the lodge, landed in a tree, disappeared. And an hour later when the person is out there in the woods, standing under a tree, uh, embracing say the, their child self, um, that bird is nested now eight feet above them, standing in a nest, feeding babies. Uh, it's like, how does that happen? <laughs> um, so hey, you need to realize like, you're oriented and working with many, many things. I wanted uh, to let you know we're at seven minutes. Okay. So third, third session um, is a lot of that, beginning to in, enter people's awareness into that field of information and how to work with it. Uh, the fourth session 
is dedicated to working with the elementals. Um, so we focus uh, each day on one of the one of the elements, do teachings, and then that night we'll do a, like a radical fire ritual, and then we'll move to earth the next day, and really focus on on working with earth and all the aspects of earth um, as spirit, as elemental medicine, um, and then do a radical earth ritual that night, and then so each each one of those days of that session is really focused on deepening our relationship with working with the elementals in a very visceral, personal way. The fifth session is, um, is the quest itself for the trainees, for the apprentices, where we go somewhere else in the country. And when I say that, um, for those of you who don't know where I am, I'm in Asheville, North Carolina, in the Blue Ridge Mountains. So all of the training sessions are here in this area on our land except session five. And my commitment to the training group is to take them somewhere else, hopefully that is unfamiliar territory. So you'd be a little off balance. You're not simply gonna be questing in your backyard or on the same ground we've been doing all the sessions. Uh, we wanna go to a land that's unfamiliar, um, one we haven't been on. Um, and so the last, couple of training groups, including this one that's going on currently. We've gone down to New Mexico. Um, we have some connections to some folks there that have some land near Taos and, and we'll quest there. Um, and then the last session um, at the end of the training is, is we call the giveaway. Um, and so we kind of bring it all together and uh, uh, begin to look at, you know, you know, some people will be deeply called into this, this uh, form of guiding, but it's not simply what I like to tell people. This is not about teaching you how to take somebody into woods for two weeks and giving them experience from over 11, 12 days of preparation for a four day night solo and then bringing them back and listening to stories and teaching people how to do mirroring and uh, storytelling and, and personal forming their own personal mythology. It's not just about that. It's also about if um, if a, a father walks into your office and you know says, "I'm pulling my hair out. I've got a 17 year old daughter. I have no clue what to do. We, you know, their mom died, you know, four years ago. I'm lost. What do I do about this?" And so you quickly can put it into uh, a rite of passage framework and uh, begin to work with them on developing a, uh, an initiatory rite of passage that would really serve this young lady. Um, so it's something that can be applied uh, on a one-in-one, -on -one, again, with somebody that just comes to you in your office and you work with them from that framework and offering ritual prescriptions and they do them and come back and you work with them like that. Or it also includes being able to uh, being prepared to take somebody out for an extended period of time or take a group out for an extended period of time um, in the nuts and bolts and, and form and process of holding space in a good way like that. Um, everything from what goes in your first aid box to site selection, you know, when you're looking for land to, to do this kind of work. Um, so it's, it's applicable, applicable ability if I can stretch that word out, is, is much broader than say you, you end this with being able to take somebody on a, on a vision fast experience. Um, it's, it's, it's much broader in its application than simply just that. Um, I've had a professional singer, you know, come through our program and um, although I'm not sure they're not gonna end up guiding one day, but they certainly took this work and began to weave it into their music. And, and their, um, when they would do concerts around the country, they, all of a sudden they have these new songs that are coming out of this. Um, have school teachers that begin to develop curric cur curriculum um, for certain grades and how to begin to create a kind of a, a rite of passage scenario, you know, for certain grade levels. So it's, how it shows up in one's life can, can look quite varied. Um, it doesn't have to just look like this one thing. So I know we're at the top of the hour. 
Um, I'm also remembering, Kent, that you um, have to exit for another thing soon. I'm uh, willing to stay on and answer questions and delve in a little deeper um, if folks have questions more specific um, about the experience. Um, and while Kat's on here, she's about to finish. If somebody wanted to send a question her way <laughs> um, before she takes off, she might be able to speak to her own experience of going through it. So thoughts, questions, curiosities. Wow. I've, I've uh, harangued people into silence. <laughs> I'll just ask Kate um, or Kat because you've gone through it. Just the person that you were before, whether it was you know mentally, spiritually, whatever, and where you're at now. What what is some of the, if you wish to speak to it, some of the evolution you have experienced in mm -hmm. going through the process? I think we'd need another hour for me to really answer that <laughs> question, honestly. <laughs> Um, I'm going to try and think of a couple of things. Um, I mean, I came into this training program, I was pushed in by a death of a very close person to me. Um, so I was already sort of pushed into this life enforced, death enforced rite of passage. Um, so, so much has changed over the last two years that it, it's really hard to, to separate it out. Um, one of the clear things to me that at that time that, that I was experiencing the, the death of it was my partner, um, I was having a mental internal conversation with myself. So I'm a psychologist, PhD in psychology, highly trained in, in the Western worldview of, of the mind and how we function. Um, so I was having this internal sort of conversation with myself about how do I reconcile what, how I understand I function as a psychological being with um with this sense of, of the spirit world and like now my partner is not in physical form but i feel him i know he's here i can i'm still reaching for him i can still like sense that connection um so i was going through a period of like how do i make sense of that for myself um and then and i made a i've made a very deliberate intentional decision that i was going to suspend what i had been taught about those kinds of beliefs um and actually allow it allow myself to believe that he still existed and was in now in a different form and that i could actually communicate with him um and i made that decision very consciously i was like okay i'm going to try this and just see what happens i can always change my mind <laughs> just go back to thinking how i was before um so part of the, making that decision was part of what opened me into like being able to then step into this apprenticeship with Kada. Cause I was like, well, if I'm going to go, I might as well just go deep, deep in. Right. And I might as well just like fully explore that. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things that's changed in my life is that is allowing myself to experience that, to be able to still hold my kind of Western understanding and then to be able to hold this whole other understanding um, and still on the journey of like putting those together. How do I weave those together into something that makes that I can articulate? It makes sense to me inside, but how can I articulate that is still part of my my ongoing process. But you can probably imagine that sort of ripple effect that that's had on my life. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but that is one of the sort of more profound pieces that I think has really changed for me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. It's beautiful. All right. Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay. Well, I want to end with a, a poem um, and also state that I know um, on the website, I know the early registration um, discount ended on the 12th. Um, but I'm going to extend it to anyone. Okay, Kat, take care. Thanks for being on. Um, to anyone that is, um, you know, signed up, registered, and got this this particular um, webinar, to just simply extend the discount for another week um, for those that are considering it. Um, in terms of you that are registered, which are all of you and some more. Um, now the, uh, the 
poem I want to end with. Let me find it here. Okay. I'll share it with you if I can get it on the screen. Okay, before I put it on the screen, um, oh, where'd it go? Wrong, wrong screen. Stop share. So I'll give you a little background to this poem. Um, before I put it on the screen, um, some of you have heard this, I know, but it's called uh, Follow Your Name. And it, it came uh, as an inspiration to me of a 17-year-old of a man that I worked with some years ago that was from South Africa. He was born there. To, um, and, and then he moved from there when he was eight years old, he moved to Washington, D.C. Um, so already you can see the whole disruption in cosmological view of everything going from a village in South Africa to Washington, D.C. Um, and so the initiatory path that he followed uh, took a turn from where it would have followed and ended up in gangs and in, you know, substance abuse. And, and those are the reasons he ended up in front of me because he had followed that societal's uh, map of initiation. Um, but he told me this story. I think that one of the first days I met with him, he told me this story. Um, when I asked him, I uh, said, do you have another name? Because I knew about um, some, some of the, the tribe's practices. I said, do you have another name? And he said, yes. And he looked at me kind of odd. And I said, what is it? And he said, well, when I was little, I went to live with my goji, I think is what he called her, his grandmother. And um, I lived with her for a while and she gave me a different name. She gave me another name. And um, I said, will you write it down for me? And so he wrote down this really long name across his, his notebook. And I said, read it to me. Um, and so what he read were elements and animals and features in the landscape is what was embedded or inscribed in that name that she had, his grandmother had given him. And, and then he got a sad look in his face and he looked away and he looked up and he said, you know, when I left, when I was eight years old, she told me, she said, follow your name. And I said, have you been doing that? And he said, no, I have not been following my name. Um, since then, I've also learned uh, a, a Talk, I worked with a, a, a teenage uh, girl from the Seminole tribe down in Florida, told me a very similar story, told me her name. Um, so this practice of uh, receiving a name, um, either from an elder or following a rite of passage, that these, these names are not meant to be um, descriptions of who you are or who is in front of them. Um, they are meant to be roadmaps. Um, they don't describe who you are. They describe where you're going. And, um, and I'll say, you, you know, if you get an accurate name, if, a, if an elder gives you an accurate name, you'll know it because it will not feel comfortable. And the reason it won't feel comfortable is because you haven't lived into it yet. It may take your entire life to get comfortable with it. Um, so the idea is, and so from that, all of that understanding, teaching from working with this young man and that young lady, um, I wrote this poem I want to share with you as a way to end this time together. Okay, so you can see it here. So I'll read it. <clears throat> Pay attention. Pay attention. Be careful not to distract yourself from yourself by focusing on the obstacles in your life. Focus on the delivery of your medicine, not on the stories in your head where you recount your limitations and loss. Do not indulge in such self-importance as a way to avoid taking responsibility for your medicine and the gift of healing that you came here to offer. You are the heroes and the heroines of your own story. If you are not initiated into the bone memory, into the mythology of your own life, 
you will likely be living an existence that is not entirely your own. And the life you know you must live is the one standing just a few paces in front of you, looking back over its shoulder with eyes wide, waiting for you to remember. Apprentice yourself to yourself and walk to the horizon of your own dreams, the place where you live in the absence of story, the place where the sharp edges of this unfolding moment demands your full attention. Where are you? I am here, you reply. Who are you? I am this moment. Pay attention, pay attention. Stay humble and focused. Do not move through your life in such a way that you allow another to give you a name you have no belonging to. Pay attention, pay attention. Stay humble and focused and do not, allow, do not move through your life in such a way as to allow another to give you a name that you have no belonging to. So I wanna thank you all for, for hanging in there with us uh, after we get a little bit over the hour. Um, if you wanna talk more personally about the training, um, if you go to the website, rightsofpassagecouncil.org, um, you can also set up uh, um, a 20-minute free consult call with me if you want to talk in more detail about it. Um, we do have a few spots left for the upcoming start date in August, um, and I'm happy to speak, speak to you a little further about any individual specific concerns or questions. All right. Well, thank you all again for, for joining in in this uh, circle gathering this evening, and uh, I wish you all well. Uh, thank you, Kara. Mm -hmm. right. Anything else before we close? All right. Well, I hope to hope to see you around the uh, those sacred fires one day down the road. Thank you. Right. Go well. <laughs>